What is up, y'all? Welcome back to our Fish the Moment live stream. Today, Randy and I are going to be talking about the top three winter fishing myths that you've probably heard about all the time and that are just completely not true. These are myths that have messed me up when I'm trying to fish in the winter for years, since I was like eight years old till I was like 15. I got told all these things from Bassmaster Magazine, TV shows, whatever it is, and it completely screwed up my fishing. And so we want to correct those myths for you guys today and kind of be the myth busters for bass fishing. So excited about that. Randy, how's it going? How was your Christmas? Uh, pretty good, man. It was a busy Christmas around here. You know, we got a three-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a 12-year-old in the oh, house. Man. So you can imagine Christmas is a big deal around here. So, uh, but yeah, everything looked great, man. Here, how about you guys? Yeah, everything was awesome. Holiday season's been great. It's uh, a little bit cold here. It actually snowed a week early here in Arkansas. It like, snowed a ton, and we normally don't get snow. And then Christmas Day, it was like 65 degrees and beautiful, which I'm sure a lot of guys on the stream were like, man, I wish that was me. But, uh, you know, it's it's exciting to, uh, you know, be getting into the new year. I'm excited about bunch of stuff we have coming up for Fish the Moment, and uh, we actually just got done planning our tournament schedule for this next year. Randy and I are actually going to be doing some team tournaments, so super excited about that. You guys are going to be able to watch our practices, our tournaments. We're going to wrap it up all in a video format for you guys, and I'm um, excited about that. What are, you, what are your thoughts, Randy? Man, I can't wait. That That is just like we were talking earlier. That, that takes me back to being like 20 years old again. You know, that's how I started fishing team tournaments, and you know, the team tournaments now are a lot different. I mean, they're highly competitive. You know, they give away brand new boats in a lot of the tournaments we're going to be fishing. So, man, I can't wait to get out there, especially since we're, you know, fishing here locally in Missouri, a lot of them. So, so yeah. it's, going to be fun. it's going to be a lot of fun, man. And I'm, I'm, I have one of the best partners for this area. Randy knows these lakes super well, and maybe I can throw in some little offshore stuff to complement what Randy's doing. I think we're going to be a pretty solid duo with the shallow and the offshore. We're going to be tough to beat, I think. Yeah, we're going to be live scoping them, man. We, we're going to be flipping 30-pound test line with big jigs in some tournaments and live scoping them, and it's going to, it's, <laughs> we're going to have a pretty diverse uh, schedule coming up. Yeah, we're going to be doing the Nichols Team Trail, I think, and Joe Bass. We're, we, we're pretty sure that's it. We kind of have to make sure everything lines up with uh, the open schedule and all that, but that's our plan, so I'm um, excited about that. But, uh, you know, Let's jump in straight into the topic here, Randy. And before you do that, I want to say hi to everyone. We've got so many people on the live stream. Uh, we got William, we got Ernest, Tommy, Joe, Jake. Uh, we got Dan, we got uh, Frank, the other Dan, Michael, John. How's everyone doing? A lot of people on the live stream. If you guys are listening on the podcast, welcome or just watching on YouTube. So, uh, you know, the top three winter fishing myths a topic that we're really excited about to discuss. And winter fishing, before we get into it, I want to make sure you guys realize that it's very relative to where you are in the country. So for example, in Texas or in Florida, your water temperatures might be in the high 50s or even in the 60s in the middle of the winter, whereas up north, you're standing on three feet of ice. So the winter time can kind of vary a lot depending on where you are in the country. For the purposes we're talking about in this video, a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about is when the water temperatures are below 50 degrees. That's where I really think winter fishing is at its peak. That's kind of when you talk about winter fishing, that's what I think about. 50 degree water temperature and less. Really anything from like 38 degrees to 50 degree water temperature. When you get above 50 degree water temperature in the winter, those fish are still pretty aggressive and they act more like fish in the fall almost. So you don't really have those tough winter conditions when your lake never drops below 50 degrees. But when it does, there are all these myth, misconceptions and myths about how you need to fish and what you need to do to catch winter bass. They're just completely not true. And the first one we're going to talk about is that when it's cold in the wintertime and the water temperatures are below 50 degrees, you need to fish deep. Now, deep might be relative to not just like deep as in terms of like offshore, but deep as in like fishing in 15, 20, 30, 50 feet of water. And that is definitely not the case at all. And what I want to pull up here real quick for you guys is a Navionics map and kind of set the stage, and then we'll have Randy jump in on this as well. So uh, here we have Grand Lake in Oklahoma. We use this lake a lot because it has a lot of variety to it, both in water clarity, depth of water structure, and it kind of is a good uh, lake that you could kind of relate to a lot of lakes around the country. So when I was first thinking about off or thinking about winter fishing when it got cold, my thought is that I need to be fishing the exact same places I was catching them in the summertime. 
that's offshore ledges, off of points that drop into the creek channel, off of main lake areas and main lake structure. But whenever I would try to go out and fish those areas, I wouldn't have that much success. For whatever reason, I just wouldn't catch that many fish. And honestly, I struggled to catch fish offshore in the winter time, you know, more, more than let's say 20 or 30 yards away from the bank until I was probably 20 years old. And that was 10 years into my offshore fishing uh, adventure. And what I found is that in the winter, I was a lot more successful when I would avoid the offshore areas out here in the middle of the lake and just go into some creeks and fish in less than 10 foot of water, just fish shallow. And it's shocking to me still to this day that there are so many big fish that will live in less than five feet of water year round in the winter time or just the entire winter season. You can catch fish in 40 degree water in less than five feet of water on pretty much every lake in the country. Bass are not super bothered by the cold water temperatures and they will live super shallow. Now, there are a lot of elements that dictate where those fish are going to be on certain areas, certain banks, and Randy will get into that here in a second. But the one thing I want to make clear to you guys is that the areas that you fish in the summertime offshore, in these deep areas that you think about, they're not going to be as effective when you're fishing in the winter. And a lot of times, the best course, the best strategy is to actually go into your shallower pockets and coves because that's where a lot of your big fish are. Now, we're going to get into some good offshore areas probably a little bit here uh, for winter fishing, just so you guys get an idea. But before we do that, Randy, I want to get your opinion on this and kind of talk about where you believe a lot of guys think about fishing in the wintertime and also where you actually fish. Well, I, I think a lot of it, you know, we we have come so far as far as the knowledge that we have about wintertime fishing. I can remember back when I first started bass fishing back in the late 70s, early 80s, Everybody thought wintertime fishing was either jigging a spoon or fishing a little tiny hair jig as slow as a snail, and that bass were tough to catch, they were deep, they were not aggressive, and that's just not true anymore. So what you have is is when you have when you decide about breaking these myths in the wintertime, a lot of it has to do, like I said, with the type of lake you're fishing and also the species of the lake that you have and the percentage of the densities of different species. Because in the wintertime, if you have a lake that is strictly largemouth versus a lake that has a good mix of largemouth, spotted bass, and smallmouth, those fish are going to be positioned and they're going to relate differently into the winter uh, type of ways that you can catch them as far as, you know, being in that shallow water. Um, one of the things that I found out about wintertime fishing when you're talking about fishing like in off-colored water, places that you normally wouldn't think to catch them in, is if you have a lake that has a big population of largemouth bass, that's going to be more conducive to that. But once you have a lake that you start to get a little bit more of a percentage of spotted bass, smallmouth mix in there, then you have those bass starting to suspend and water clarity becomes more of an issue at that time. But from what I found in all the lakes I fished across the country, there is a segment of the population of those bass that will live in five foot of water or less all winter long, even when that water temperature gets down to close to 40 degrees. And I think that's something that a lot of people didn't understand, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. They just never thought to look for those bass in those areas. But what has happened is we've had this evolution of lure technology, different type of jerk baits. We've got these high tech crank baits. We've got different types of really sneaky, tricky finesse jigs that are able to catch these bass that we simply just didn't have in the past before. And where would you say, if you pull up the um, Google Earth, Randy, on your screen, you can just uh, present your screen and then pull up Google Earth. I know when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that most of the guys that you take out on your on the water fishing trips, your guy fishing trips, they think about winter fishing as fishing bluff walls, super steep banks where your boat's sitting in 60, 70, 80 feet of water. Or maybe they're fishing out somewhere randomly in the middle of the lake on a hump. And I see most guys when I go to the lake on those type areas. They go to the steepest, rockiest bank they can find, and they don't really catch them all that well. Um, but you, you having trouble there, Randy? Yeah, I'm getting I'm pulling it up right okay. now here. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Awesome. You see it on there? Yep, I got you. Yeah, that, Johnny, that right there is one of the biggest. That That is a huge myth in wintertime fishing as far as the, the, that you have to fish vertical because – to be honest with you, 
I very seldom, I fish a lot in the winter. I mean, you know how much I fish in the winter. We do these, you know, the fish the moment uh, on the water lessons. I fish in the winter a lot. I very seldom fish vertical structures in the winter time. For me, when I think about winter, fishing the more vertical structures in the winter, that's the place where you catch the bigger bass, but you catch a lot fewer bass. There's not as many bass, in my opinion, that use those vertical structures, although those those big rogue five pound plus bass, they will tend to use that vertical stuff. But for me, it's not. Now, let me give you an example here. I, I was just on Grand Lake um, yesterday. I had a, we had an on the water lesson. And I'll show you guys right where we caught them at to sort of give you an example here. And here what was the water temp on there, Randy, uh, when you were there, by the way? Uh, what was the water temp uh, when you guys were there? Yeah, water temperature yesterday in Grand Lake was anywhere between 43 to 45 degrees. Hmm. And that's one of the things about the wintertime. It's like um, we've had water temperatures, you know, pushing 50 degrees here just up until the last week or so. But what happens when you get these cold 15, we had 13 degree night one night. Once you get these temperatures in the teens, it doesn't take anything to cool that water down really quick. But given that, those fish still do not move deep. So here's an example right here. This is Duck Creek. This is probably the most famous wintertime fishing creek on the lake, simply because it's got good, clean water, although you do have some stain in the back. And when I'm talking about clean, I'm talking about, you know, you've got that two and a half foot visibility. It's not, it's not clear like the White River Lakes. So you still have a stain to it, but for Grand, it's fairly clean. These fish that we caught yesterday back on Grand, I'll take, for example, I'll show you right where we caught some here. You go back to the main creek here, and here's coves off the main lake. A lot of people would think in the wintertime that you're going to catch these fish out on, like on the main points, sort of these main deeper creek points. The bass we were catching yesterday at Grand on jerk baits, we caught everything on the mega bass jerk baits. We're on these little secondary points, these flatter points towards the backs of the coves. And I think we caught a couple nice ones right here on this point right here. This particular point. Um, it's a gradual sloping point. Your boat, you know, if the boat is, say, right where that mark is there, you may be in 15 or 20 feet of water, being able to hit the bank, a nice, you know, less than a 45-degree angle a bank slope on this, a gravel, small rock gravel bank. And, uh, you know, this is a big myth. I mean, here you got 43-degree water. We're almost in January, and these bass are in the backs of the coves. 30 years ago, I never would have thought to look for this. I would have spent, I'd have been out here on this main creek area, you know, trying to fish these deeper main points out here in 25 or 30 foot of water. But those bass weren't here yesterday. They were back in the backs of these coves, you know, little bitty, see these little subtle rounded points in these cuts here? This is what those fish set up on in that cold weather. Two and a half foot of visibility uh, and they live there all winter long. They're going to be there all winter. So that's that's one example of it anyway. Yeah, and that's something that I find is super typical in the winter is the fish are shallower and further along in the creeks than you would actually expect. And uh, if you stop sharing your screen, Randy, I'll pull up a couple more examples too. Um, yeah. And I'll pull them up. Let, me give, you, oh, go let ahead. me give you one, one more quick example here, guys, before we go off the screen here on this particular point. When you're dealing with... with off-colored water in the winter time on this point like i said where we got two here you've got two populations of bass living on this point you've got these bass that are in less than five foot of water against the bank that you're pulling off the bottom and also sometimes you'll get a bite halfway back to the boat those fish suspended four or five foot down over 10 foot of water so they're using you know different uh, uh you know depth setups there yeah, and that, that's super common for my fishing, and honestly, that's a lot of times why I feel like I catch a lot of good fish, and let me transition over to, to uh, Navionics for you guys. I feel like I catch a lot of really good fish in the wintertime in places where a lot of guys would never even think. So, for example, if you're on Grand Lake again, you can catch a lot of really good fish way back in these creeks and back in these pockets off of, for example, like this short little point right here, or off some of these more rounded, flat points. And as you can see with the Navionics, these points do have a creek channel that is running somewhat close to them. You have 30, 35 feet of water out in front of them. But the actual point itself is in like 6, 7, 8 feet of water. And it's almost, Randy, like offshore fishing to an extent, even though you're fishing in the back of a creek, where you're positioning your boat, and I know I do too, 
maybe 30, 40 yards off the bank, and your bait isn't landing on the shoreline. It's actually landing 20, 30 feet away from the bank, and you're working it kind of out here in the middle of nowhere. But those fish will suspend on those long, slow, tapering points, and that's where a lot of those big, you know, rogue bass, those roamers will set up. And usually you can find like wolf packs where if you find a good point, you'll catch three or four fish off of one point and then pull up on another point and catch three or four more fish. Yeah, definitely so. And, you know, anytime that you get any lake that you have around the country, when you're dealing with a major creek on the lower end of the lake, you're going to have a couple different mixtures of water clarity. And you're going to have a lot of options within that creek. You're going to be able to catch bass you know back in that five foot of water on some of the place that johnny was just talking about so there's going to be a lot of different options based upon how that creek's laid out but what you're going to have is you're going to have certain areas that attract bigger numbers of fish and then certain areas that attract fewer numbers of fish but larger potential larger potential the biggest bass i ever caught on grand lake was a uh, in jan third week of january on an area just like Johnny described, you know, those flats that run way out there, um, prime areas for big bass, even though you, you may not have like big numbers of them using them. And I think big misconception that a lot of guys have again is like, if you look at this Creek here on grand, there's a really nice bluff wall out in front of this. You can see the, the main channel is 90 feet of water and it runs up against this main Lake point and it drops off from like 20 foot of water into a hundred foot of water. And there are fish that will use this type of area. Like like Randy said, a lot of big fish will set up on these main lake bluffs. But there are kind of a few and far between to get those fish to bite. You might get one six or seven pounder there, but you're not going to get the numbers. And so a lot of guys will go out in the winter and they might have one big fish they catch, which is awesome. But they might struggle to put two or three or four more fish with them, especially if you're in a tournament or just fun fishing. And it's because they're not heading into the creeks far enough. And I find that when I'm developing some sort of wintertime strategy, I don't just focus on just the kind of backs and middle of the pockets. I'm also using some of the main lake bluffy, like deeper areas because you can catch some big fish there. It's just, like Granny said, you're not going to get the, the quantity. And one thing to talk about with these areas is that you don't just want to go into a creek where there's literally no water depth. So, for example, you don't want to be back into a pocket like this where there is it's just a flat pocket with nothing going on and there's no deep water for 100 yards. You want to be in an area where you have some deep water access very close by to the shallower water. So, like a pocket like this, you have a nice rounded point here, a rounded point here, and you have 60 foot of water right here. These rounded points that kind of run out slowly, these are your prime winter areas. And this is where you're going to find a lot of numbers, even like this point right here. But then if you want to catch a big one, you can head over to this steep, rocky bluff wall and fish a jig or maybe a jerkbait in Alabama rig, and you'll get that one big bite. So you don't have to necessarily always fish deep, but you can fish deep. And you can even catch fish offshore in the winter, especially if you have that water clarity. That's one thing that Randy was talking about. And let me actually pull up Google Earth real quick to kind of show you Grand Lake. If you look at Grand Lake on a Google Earth map, where Randy was kind of talking about earlier was down here in Duck Creek. And you have, you know, sometimes two and a half, even up to four foot of visibility. This this year, it looks like on this Google Earth image, it's clearer than um, it is now. But like right now on Duck Creek, the water visibility is two and a half foot of visibility. But if you have, let's say, five or six foot of visibility, for example, if we slide on over to Beaver Lake, you might catch fish in the dam section where you have seven foot of visibility. A lot of those fish might be living in 60, 70, 80 feet of water. But even in those situations, you're going to find fish on Beaver Lake that you can catch on a jerkbait and a crankbait in a foot of water, even when they're seven foot of water visibility. They're just up there shallow. The trick is that you need some sort of uh, wind or cloud cover to get those fish active. When you get into the dirtier water, however, like here on Beaver, that's when those fish will live shallow and stay shallow, even when those water temperatures are super cold, even when there's a bright bluebird sky sunny day. And one of the best areas that you can look for in those situations when you have that dirty water and you have that um, that cold water is riprap. Riprap is one of the best wintertime areas, and that's just basically like man-made rocky banks. They hold a lot of heat, and whenever you have water visibilities of less than a foot and a half visibility, maybe even less than two feet, 
Throwing a crankbait and a jig down riprap, even the Alabama rig, is one of the best ways to catch giant winter bass. Would you agree with that, Randy? Yeah, rock is key. When you're talking about off-colored wintertime, you know, catching them shallow, basically, in the wintertime, you got to have rock. And like Johnny said, riprap is the best rock to hold heat, particularly, uh, you know, if you got some fairly deep water off of it. But that being said, that's why, you know, your, your chunk rock banks, the rock transitions, those places that are like two-thirds of the way back into the creek, uh, places that you have so you begin to have a little bit of water clarity change, but you still have that big rock. And um, for me, that's been the big key because that's what will get those fish shallow. If you tend to have the flatter gravelly type banks, uh, the points, that type of stuff, that's when you start having those fish mix up between suspending, using the bottom, roam a little bit more. But you can really pinpoint them a lot more, you know, if you can get to that, that bigger rock. And uh, that's one of the first things that, that I'll look for in the wintertime if I want to fish shallows. I'll run, uh, I'll go back and I'll share my screen here. Yeah, yeah, me. go for it. Good. Yeah, that's one, while well, Brandon said pulled up, one thing that he said there, guys, it's super important to remember is that water clarity is key. When you have stained water, dirty water, that's when those fish will get shallower. But when you have yeah, clear me, water, it's not that case. I'm going to pull up. Uh, we'll go back into, into Horse Creek here. I'm going to show you guys a prime example of a shallow water winter type area. And this is this is just, uh, I'm just using Horse Creek as an example, but you can use this on any, any lake that you fish, you know, anywhere you go. Now, back in Horse Creek here, um, this... Here's the back of the creek here. It flattens out. You get willows, gravelly mud banks, that type of stuff. But back in the creek here, this bank right here is the last channel swing rocky type bank before it starts flattening out. You can see here, this is a really, really steep bank. It's sort of a, it's not really a bluff, but it's close to a bluff. But it's the last steep rock bank before the creek starts to flatten out in the bank here. And this is what you want to look for if you're looking for shallow fish in stained water in the wintertime. Go back into these coves, coves and creeks. And if you go all the way back into the back, you can see, see here how the bank's starting to flatten out a little bit. You got a little bit of rock mixed in. And then you gradually start to get to steeper banks. And this last steep bank, before you get to those flats, those fish will live on this shallow banks all year long you can catch them shallow cranking you can catch them pitching a jig up there um, it's one option if you don't want to get out and throw a jerk bait or an alabama rig you know for those uh suspended deeper fish yeah and so um a rule of thumb there randy would be if you're in let's say two foot of water visibility or less go to those steep rocky banks whether it's a bank like you see here on the screen that's like a channel swing bank with big rock or on the riprap but if you have more than two foot of water visibility the points we showed you earlier with the, the flatter tapering points um, that stick out off the bank, those are your places where the bass will suspend, and that's where they'll be in that clear water. Those points, though, again, they're not deep points. The, the place where the fish are going to be, they're going to be sitting over 10 foot of water, suspended 5 feet down. So you're really only fishing 10 foot of water, and the fish are in 5 foot of water. But yeah. you're fishing on those slow tapering points in the backs of creeks. So it's still pretty shallow relative to what people think for winter fishing. And that's in that clear water. I, Danny, I got a prime example of that, what you just said there. Take a look at this. You can see that on the phone, this is that, this is that biggest, the biggest bass I ever caught on Grand. You can see there it's... Here, you uh, see, stop sharing your screen, Randy, so people can see your full screen. I want them to see that uh, in full. Oh, uh, can you, let me see. That. Yeah. Okay, can you see that now? Yep, yeah, man. That is January 13th at Grand Lake. As that fish was 10 and a half pounds, biggest fish I ever caught on Grand. And let me show you guys where I caught that. I'm going to start sharing my screen again because it's exactly what Johnny just showed there. Um, I'll sh and I I'm going to give this spot away only because I have never caught a another bass there in the wintertime before. But there was a 10 and a half pounder on it uh, in January a few years ago. And I, but this is a textbook place to just what Johnny just described there, what we're looking at. So 
By the way, Randy, how many guys would that. how many guys would give away a spot where they caught a ten pound bass on Grand Lake other than fish the moment? Les, if yeah. guys, if you if if you like the fact that Randy's giving away a spot where he caught a ten pounder, ten pounders are crazy rare on Grand Lake. Leave a like down yeah. below. No one does that. Go down, leave a like on the video, go subscribe. I feel like that's worth a like right there just for this. Okay, I, a lot of you guys may know Sheldon Collins that lives on Grand. He was with me when I caught that fish. In fact, he took the picture. But um, here we are. Uh, th this is Honey Creek. If you guys ever been back in Honey Creek before? And just like Johnny said, you know, you, these fish set up in the back of these creeks on these flat points. And in this particular spot, I'll show you guys. I'll get over here. This is exactly what we're talking about here. See this point right here? This is a long flat point. You can't see it on the, the uh, Google Earth, but this point runs out here. And say where the little hand is here, the boat's in like uh, probably 15 foot of water. That fish was sitting right out on the end of that point. It's a, it's a gradual slope and gravelly point, drops off on both sides. And that 10 and a half pounder was sitting right out there, two thirds of the way back into this creek, uh, just sitting out there by himself. So that's the prime example of what he's just talking about. Yeah, and uh, if you stop sharing your screen, Randy, I'll show the guys on Navionics too, just so they can get a better look at that. Um, on Navionics here, guys, this is what it looks like. Again, halfway back in a creek like we talked about, and it's a very gradual sloping point. And this honestly, to me, Randy, is kind of like offshore fishing in a way. Your boat was probably positioned almost in the middle of this creek, but you're casting up in that you know, four or five foot of water range working it offshore. Yep. Your boat's 50 yards off the bank. And this is a, like the offshore stuff I fish in the winter, guys. This is what I focus on. And this is stuff that very few guys fish because they're so keyed in on those steep, rocky banks that they ignore these flat, long, gradual points that drop off at the end. But this is the juice in the winter time. Yeah, and this is that's the type of place that, you know, 20 years ago, I never would have fished. I mean... I'd have been out there just like you said on those main lake bluffs, you know, steep points and places you normally think that's uh, is going to be. But um, these fish, you know, they just they do things that you know you never would think. I've caught them like you, you can go back in the in the even some of the shallow pockets in the backs of those coves in the winter time when the water is in the upper forties and catch them like on a rattle trap sometimes even. Oh yeah. Uh, so they, you know. The, the, the bait, it's all about, you know, keying in on the bait. And I've seen shad swimming right on the surface in 40-degree water before. Um, yesterday, water temperature 43 degrees. I saw turtles on the surface. So these cold-blooded creatures, they just don't shut down, you know, when it gets cold, including the bass. For sure. And you got that, I'm sure, on a Vision 110, right, Randy? Yeah, you can actually see it. Let me see. Uh, you can actually see it in its mouth here. Let me, you guys can see that. And, yeah, of course, with Vision it's, 110. Come on, guys, it's that, winter fishing. That was actually a 110 plus one. 110 plus one? Yeah, so, uh, well, yeah, but I, I fished that point 100 times in the winter time since then, and I've never caught one, so you guys go after it. You can catch one there, good luck. <laughs> I think awesome. that fish, he just may have swum over there, but uh, but I've, I have caught him at a lot of different similar points to that. I mean, it's not that they're not on that type of stuff. I've caught... You know, hundreds of bass on places that look just like that around the lake. Oh, by the way, someone said that that's uh, that's Biffle's spot. So if you guys want to go, you gotta say you gotta say hundred yards away. If you see Biffle, go the yeah. other way. Oh, um, <laughs> well, that's a great segue, by the way, Randy, with your jerk bait stuff because. I want to let you guys know that we actually have a jerkbait seminar coming up. And if you go to fishthemoment.com and then head over to our virtual seminars page, Randy is going to be doing an advanced winter jerkbait fishing seminar. And there are only, I think, like 12 or 13 spots left in the seminar. And we're only doing the seminar one more time this year. And Randy's going to be getting into the best areas, the best conditions, the best retrieves, and the best equipment to fish a deep or a, a jerk bait in the winter time and randy actually helped design the vision 110 from mega bass the most popular jerk bait on the market you actually sent rogues that you had custom weighted and everything to japan for them to work on right randy yep absolutely we uh sent about probably two dozen of my best uh modified custom painted ones that i've weighted up where they you know just were perfectly you know set up and 
shipped them over to Japan to Hamamatsu City at the Megabass plant, and next thing you know, Vision 110 was born. That's awesome, and that seminar is on Thursday, January 7th, so you still have a little bit of time to sign up, but I would highly recommend the seminar. Randy is a jerkbait fishing master, and it's like a once-in-a-lifetime chance to get the information he's going to be giving. Um, we have a lot of slides and graphics, just like you guys are used to in the Fishing Moment YouTube videos um, that we put out, all that stuff in the seminar. And I also do have a advanced electronics seminar coming up, focused on how to really dial in your electronics to find and catch more fish offshore with electronics and that one's coming up january 21st so if you guys do want to brush up on your electronics definitely check out that seminar and another thing i did for you guys it's actually free on fishmoment.com if you go to the website go to the home page and then go up to the top it says learning plans what i did here is i put all of my best youtube videos i've created over the last four years together for you guys and i know there's a ton of videos on youtube and you don't know which ones to watch this has Literally all my videos organized by the ones that I put the most time and effort into and the ones that are the best. So here's like sonar fishing basics videos. Here's your videos for side imaging, for down imaging, for graphing and idling. And a lot of these videos you guys probably have not seen because you weren't recommended them by the algorithm or you just haven't seen them yet. If you guys like the content on this channel, I 100% recommend going onto this page and watching every single one of these videos. They Each video I spend about 40 hours making, anywhere between 20 to 40 hours making each video. Some of these I spent probably 60 hours making. So this is literally hundreds of hours of my life on these videos alone, and they're my best videos. So definitely check this out. It's basically focused on offshore fishing and how to improve your offshore fishing so just check them all out um definitely worth your time and then um, just one more thing I always call out is we have our uh, lake breakdowns too our winter lake breakdowns are available uh fall breakdowns uh, if you guys still want to check out those and then also we do our virtual fishing lessons and randy does the personal lake breakdowns where it gives you 40 waypoints on your home lake so super cool stuff there now one more thing i do want to talk about guys i know we're talking about a bunch of uh this stuff, but uh, got to keep the lights on, keep the podcast going. Uh, one thing I'll talk about is the new fish tools box by Jewel Bait Company. You guys had saw that we did the Christmas box with Jewel, and the fish tools box is actually something they just came out with where you get $60 worth of baits for $30, basically. So you get $60 worth of premium baits, jigs, spinner baits, jig heads, all the best um, you know, baits made in the United States, basically half off. And if you take a look here on the screen, basically, it comes in a nice box like this every single month. And I actually help put together these boxes every single month with baits that are designed specifically to help you guys catch fish in the season you're fishing. So it's a super cool way to, um, you know, get some good fishing tackle you guys have done like mystery tackle box maybe or some other stuff these are all like premium quality baits these aren't knockoffs that come from china that were on the end of the production line or reject baits or extra stock with weird colors this is all premium content that you can or premium uh, products you can buy straight on jules website you can you know get the baits you can see them it's not like leftover stock it's like all good quality stuff and because that they're basically produced in the u.s and go straight from the production line into the box to your house they can give them to you at the basically the manufacturing cost so you save 50 percent markup from like retailers and all that stuff so it's a great option definitely check it out jewelbait.com so Awesome. That is it. That's it for the promos. Thanks for sticking through that, guys. Always appreciate that. We actually are getting some sponsors now for the live stream and obviously have to promote Fish the Moment so we can provide this content to you guys for free and the YouTube content as well because that's what we love to do. We love to provide the free content, but we also have to you know, pay the bills, right, Randy? That's right, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's get to the next um, topic here. So the next winter fishing myth is that you need to fish slow. That's something that I hear all the time. You have to fish super slow in the winter, especially when water temperatures are like 45 degrees or less. But I found that that is completely not true in a lot of situations. Now, there are times when it is true, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But honestly, I find that guys fish way too slow in the wintertime and don't cover enough water because they have this, this idea in their mind that they have to be moving their bait super slow. They have to be... Um, working really hard to get these fish in the boat. And one great example of this is I was over on the lake similar to Grand Lake. No, it's not exactly Grand. 
on uh, it's one of these a, a little lake by my house water temperatures were 43 degrees and i was fishing offshore but what i was doing is taking a football jig and i'll try to try find the area that it was similar to where i was fishing it was kind of uh like a point like this that kind of ran out and then it dropped off into a channel but it was kind of this long sloping point and there were some brush piles out here I pulled up there and I threw my jig in that brush pile. And as soon as that jig made contact with that brush, that fish ate it. And it was a five pounder. Throw my next cast in there. Bait barely hits the brush, catch a four pounder. I go back to that same spot later in the day, catch a six and a seven pounder. And I have all of it on camera. I'll be showing you guys a video of that. But basically the jig just got within like the realm of the brush pile and that fish ate it. It wasn't like I needed to just soak that jig in the brush pile all day long. And really I find that whenever you get baits around an aggressive fish in the winter, they bite really quick. The trick is finding enough aggressive fish to actually eat your bait. And what I find is that actually fishing at the same speed you fish in the summer is actually a good thing because the faster you fish, maybe not the fast in terms of like how you reel your bait or how you retrieve it, but moving a lot, moving to different areas, making five to 10 presentations in an area and moving on is a lot more efficient because the goal in my mind in the winter is to find five active and aggressive bass, or maybe even a school of aggressive bass that are setting up on an area like this, or even down like a certain bank. And you'll be shocked in the winter time how many fish feed in small feeding windows. So for example, what you'll find is maybe if you're going and cranking down this bank that Randy talked about earlier, you might find that only two hours out of the day, the fish will actually feed on this bank. But if you can pull up here at the right two hour window, whether it's with the sun being out or the wind blowing on it, you might be able to catch four fish off this bank. Boom, 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 boom. But if you fish it in any other feeding window that's not that two hour window, you're not going to catch anything. Those fish are not going to be aggressive. So what you have to do a lot of times in the winter is cover water, move a lot of spots, hoping that you hit one of these areas when those fish are actively feeding. Now, you might find that the fish are on this bank, this bank, they're on this bank, they're on all these banks. They're maybe just sitting suspended, but when you get around those active fish, you can catch them really quickly and you can catch them with a reaction bait like a lipless crankbait or a jerk bait or um you know medium down crankbait or a jig and it's not like you have to sit there and just like work it super super slow to get those fish to bite you can reel it at a medium pace maybe work your jerk bait with a decent twitch or a pause maybe a two or three second pause and work your jig at a normal pace and still get bit and so one thing I think a lot of guys mess up in the winter is that they don't cover enough water they fish maybe two or three bluffy banks all day long because that's what they're told to do. They just move their jig a foot every 20 seconds and just like dead stick their bait. But what happens is that it doesn't matter how slow you fish your jig down this bank if you're not there at the feeding window. If they feed here at noon and you're fishing there from 8 until 11 and then leave, you're not going to catch anything. But if you pull up here at, that, at noon and fish your bait at a medium speed, you're going to catch 10 or maybe you know, 3 to 4 to 5 fish, maybe 10 fish off these banks. Would you agree with all that, Randy? Yeah, definitely the part about the feeding windows, because in the wintertime, you definitely have feeding windows. And for me, most of the time, that is sometime during the middle of the day when you have the biggest, greatest amount of light penetration in the water. Um, for me, you know, when you're talking about fishing slow, fishing fast, or finding your pace, um, it's all about the technique that you're using. Now, for me, when I, when I, when I fish in the wintertime, and I, I, I do fish in the winter a lot, more than most anyone I know, in the Ozarks, this part of the country, which we have a lot of diversity and water clarity. I'm basically fishing three different techniques. I'm fishing a jerk bait, an Alabama rig, or a swim bait. Occasionally a jig. You know, Johnny fishes a jig deep a lot in the wintertime, but I'm, I'm more of a jerk bait, Alabama swim bait guy. For me, when you're talking about fishing too slow, a lot of it has to do with your water clarity and how the fish are positioned. If you're dealing with water visibility, say over three foot deep, and especially if you've got suspended fish in that situation, I found out that you don't have to fish slow at all. It's just like Johnny said, if the fish are there, they're going to bite. Um, they're usually pretty aggressive. And I fish my swim baits and my Alabama rigs and my jerk baits at a fairly decent pace even if the water temperature is like in the low 40s. I mean, I, I don't pause my jerk bait very long. I don't, I keep the Alabama rig moving. I just reel the swim bait at a medium, medium pace. 
the only times that I have found out that you have got to slow down in the winter time is when you're dealing with your water clarities um, that are like, say, in that two foot range or less. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't fish visibility of water less than two foot very much. I normally look for that two foot as my minimum level. When you're in that situation in the winter time, if that water temperature is super cold, that is when I found out that you have to slow down. And the way that I slow down, it's not just like going down a bank and like Johnny made a good point about the jig. It's not like you work your jig slow. It's a matter of staying with the bait that will produce best in that situation. And for me, it's a jerk bait. And say, for example, if I'm on a, a real tight, small secondary point that maybe say the secondary point only has a sweet spot of like 20 foot on it, water visibility of two foot. That is when I slow down. That's when I'll fish the bait super slow. I'll let it set for a long time. I'll make repeated casts at different angles because I know the bass are there. I know those bass are sitting somewhere on that secondary point. And in the, in the decreased water visibility, that's when I have to slow down. But for the most part, I don't fish that water visibility that much. I'm looking for that three foot plus visibility water. And you simply do not have to slow down on that. You have to, you, it's not like, it, I, what I found out in bass fishing in general, it's like, I don't like to think in terms of fishing slow or fast or whatever. I'm thinking about always finding the right pace for the condition. And that pace is centered around water visibility, water clarity, the wind, time of day, bank angle. There's a lot of variables that add up to that. So um, it's always about finding that right pace. Yeah, that, that's a really good call out there, Randy, and that's something that uh, is definitely rings true as well. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, when I fish a lot in Lake Dardanelle in the uh, wintertime, I used to fish out there a lot. Lake Dardanelle is part of the Arkansas River, and so it's really muddy. Like, you have sometimes 12 inches, maybe even 8 inches of water visibility in some sections. And when you get in that super dirty water, like, for example, right here by the, um, the State Park, Illinois Bayou State Park, right here the um, riprap here, sometimes you'll have a foot of water visibility and water temperatures will be 40 degrees, but you can still just hammer them off this riprap in the winter. And I actually have a video from like three years ago, Randy, where I caught a limit for like 13 pounds off this riprap in the first hour of the morning. Water temperatures were 40.9 degrees. And I was catching them first hour of the morning, right when the sun came up. And I was fishing a flat side crankbait and I was just reeling it as slow as I possibly could while keeping bottom contact. And whenever you're dealing with super cold water, less than 45 degree water temperatures and less than, let's say a foot and a half, two foot of water visibility, like Randy said, that's when you have to just crawl your crankbaits, reel them as slow as you can, fish your jerkbaits really slow. That's the only exception. And that's one reason why a lot of guys feel like they can't catch fish in that dirty water. And that's actually the last myth that a lot of guys think about winter fishing is that you can't catch fish in dirty water. You need clear water to catch bass in the wintertime. And in general, that's the case. For example, if we're over here on Dardanelle, some of the best areas on the lake in the wintertime are, for example, these strip pits that are over here. These are literally old, mined out strip pits. You can see the water visibility here is super clear. It has like three, four, five foot of visibility. And in here, this is where a lot of tournaments get won, but there's also a lot of boat pressure here because that clear water, like Randy mentioned earlier, makes those fish more susceptible to being caught. They are more aggressive. You don't have to work your bait as slow. You can reel your bait at a normal pace and kind of fish at a normal speed like you would in the fall or even in the spring and catch fish. So that clear water does make those fish more aggressive. However, you can still catch fish in super dirty water. Out here in real muddy water, out on the main lake, in a foot of visibility, you just have to slow down a ton. Drag your bait super slow, reel your bait super slow. And a lot of times, like when I'm fishing on the Arkansas River on other pools, I found like if we go down to where I kind of grew up fishing, um, there's a couple areas where I've gone and I've caught fish off the, um, you know, back in some of these backwater areas where there's a little bit of a steeper bank and off some of these like points and stuff like this, where you have a foot of visibility and there's like grass and stuff out in front. And I'll just fish a jerk bait and dead stick it for like 15 seconds. And all of a sudden a four pounder will come up and eat it. And the water's so dirty that those fish need time to actually like see the bait. And so I'm throwing bright sartreuse or bright white matte white baits, letting them suspend for 15, 20 seconds in their face, and then working the bait again, just super slow. And when you deal with super cold, dirty water, that's 
the way you have to catch them. And that's why a lot of guys don't catch them in dirty water in the winter. And they prefer to just go to a clear water lake. Have you heard that myth before too, Randy? Yeah, definitely so. I mean, the, the, the point which you made about, you know, the bass will bite in dirty water, but you have got to adjust your, your approach and your presentation to catch them. And that is the time that you're right. You're using those brighter colors. You're slowing that bait down. You're giving them a chance to find that bait because a, a, a jerk bait and a lot of different baits in the wintertime, they're sight oriented baits. Uh, and if they can't see it, they've got to be able to find it with their lateral line. One of the things that I'll add to that is the fact that um, when you're talking about cold water fishing, in my opinion, you've got three different phases of that cold water. You've got the early winter when the water is dropping down to its lowest point. You've got the mid part of the winter, which we're getting into right now, where the water is the bottom out, it's the lowest point. And then you have the late winter where the water is still cold, but it's starting to rise up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But what happens in my experience is that when you start getting in towards like the end of January and, prefer, and more actually in the first part of February, even though that water temperature is really cold, like Johnny was saying about catching the Dardanelle in 40 degree water, once you start getting those longer daylight hours, those bigger fish will move up shallow in that dirty water in the wintertime, even if it's cold, because it's almost like there's some, there's some variable that has to do with the increased daylight hours that will put those big fish in that dirty water shallower than they've ever been all winter long. Um, and there's a lot of times there seems to be no reason why they should be there. It's like, why should a bass you know, a four pounder being two foot of water in 40 degree water. And a lot of it has to do with, it just goes to show you there's more important things than water temperature. I know, I, here's a prime example I'm talking about. When they had the Bassmasters Classic at Grand Lake in February, um, you know, Matt Heron's a good friend of mine. He was down there pre-fishing and he was telling me that he got on a really solid uh, flat bill crank or uh, just a flat sided crankbait bite in the muddy water right on the bank, water temperature was like 41, 42 degrees. He, he said these bass were literally in two foot of water right on the rocks. But what happened is even though that water temperature was still 40 degrees, you started to get into February. Your daylight hours or another, they were 20, 30 minutes longer than they were during when it was 40 degrees in January. So just remember that is pay attention to your daylight hours as much as water clarity or temperature especially in early and late winter. That's super good advice. And I think a lot of guys get, they spend too much time worrying about the water temperature and a lot less time worrying about the water clarity when you come when it comes to fishing, both on the high end and on the low end. Honestly, what I find is as long as you have forage present, whether that's bait fish, you know, shad, gizzard shad, threadfin shad, whatever it is, crawfish or bluegill if there's food around there there's going to be bass living there because honestly i find bass are super resilient creatures i've actually seen bass there's youtube videos all over the place to this but like you guys are throwing frogs over the top of ice on like shallow like thin ice like new ice over the top of like underwater grass mats that have ice over top of them and bass are blowing up on frogs through the ice eating top water frogs bass are crazy like they will eat they don't care they really don't care and so what I would say is don't get too bothered about water temperature, all that stuff. Water clarity is the biggest factor that influences what these bass can be doing. And we've kind of given tips on that. But one other thing for all you guys down there, I, I see in the comments, we're going to answer questions here in just a second, guys. Um, but what, uh, what I did hear about is guys who are saying like, man, I am, uh, my lake the, has a maximum of a foot of visibility. That's like, you know, great water clarity for my lake. And just to kind of give you guys an example of some lakes like that, uh, I need to find the lake I'm trying to go to. Um, I'm going to go over here to a really shallow, muddy, just kind of mud hole. Um, I'm getting lost here. Here we go. Um, here's a couple lakes like this. Like, for example, a lake like this is just super shallow and just a mud hole. There's some clear water sections up over here, but a lot of the lake is super shallow and muddy. Well, in this situation, there's three things you want to look for when your lake has one foot of visibility maximum. 
First, you want to find the clearest possible water. So even on these really dirty water lakes, there are going to be sections, like for example, back in this area, back in here, where you have a little bit more clear water. You can see the water has a brighter or a, uh, a darker green to it, as opposed to this bright green over here. And no matter how dirty your lake is, there's going to be a section where you have a little bit of clear water running in somewhere. It might be a difference between 12 inches of visibility and 18 inches, just a half a foot visibility difference. But a lot of times that will push a lot of shad in that area. It'll make them a little more comfortable and those fish will bite a little bit better. What a lot of times happens too is it's not like you're fishing super deep. So for example, I'm gonna burn some areas here. People aren't gonna be happy, but I'm gonna go over to Millwood Lake here. So one really good example of this is on like a Lake Millwood. It's super um, dirty on the main lake and up in these rivers. But there's some areas, for example, if you look at the main river where you have super muddy water, but if you go back in some of these backwaters, whoa, you can see it gets really dark and you can see there's some boats back in here and you can catch them back in just these cypress trees and around shallow grass, if there's grass in there, a lot of times the water is clear because there's shallow vegetation. But a lot of times it's just that there's just, the water is a little bit more protected from the elements from the the main river in the mud and you can get into these little backwater sloughs that have a little bit clearer water and just catch them throwing a square bill crankbait a spinner bait and a jig and just fish like it's the springtime just fish all the visual cover pitch and flip and cast and this is where i always go when i fish on these mud hole lakes is i just go on google earth and i find the clearest water possible i try to find a way to get my boat back in there and once i do i'm usually catching them so um clear water is good to be in be in because it does make those fish easier to catch though you don't need it to catch them that's i guess what i would say there anything else to add there andy yeah, definitely. So when you're, you know, bass have to eat, you know, it doesn't matter how cold the water is, they still have to eat, they, they eat, they eat all the time. And for me, when you're dealing with that water visibility of 12 inches, there's been two things that add up for me. Number one is I don't like wind. I want, I want that bank and that water to be glass calm, glass smooth. So I'm looking for areas that are protected by the wind. And I'm also looking for that shallow rock. And when you got like you said, if you got the cleanest water within that dirty water, no wind and rock, that's where those bass are going to be shallow when the water's dirty. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, that's it. And that's really, guys, the big three myths. So we have, you know, you need to fish offshore. You need to fish deep. One of those two. Maybe not just offshore. You need to fish deep in the winter. Not the case. You can catch them in the backs of the creeks up shallow. No problem. Number two, you need to fish slow. We just talked about that. You don't need to slow down unless you're in that really dirty cold water, less than two foot of visibility. But if you find that two plus visibility, you can fish pretty quick and still catch a lot of fish. And it's also important to cover a lot of water so that you hit those feeding windows appropriately. And the third is you need the third myth is that you need to fish in clear water. While fishing in clear water is preferred, it's not mandatory. You can catch them in very dirty cold water you just need to find basically find rock and slow down slow down a lot fish really slow and methodically and find rock and you can catch them in that dirty water so hopefully that kind of gives you guys an idea for winter fishing of how to tackle it and if you guys haven't uh, been on the whole stream or you're just joining in this video is posted on YouTube afterwards, and we also put it on the Fish the Moment podcast as well. So if you want to go to the Apple iTunes podcast uh, or on Spotify, you can go Fish the Moment podcast and find it there. Now, I do want to get to some questions here, but do you have anything else to kind of wrap up on those topics, Randy, before we start answering some questions? Yeah, you know, the, the main thing is, like I said, it's uh, it's just getting out there and doing it. I mean, I, I you know, fishing in the wintertime is not the easiest thing to do. But, um, you know, it can be super rewarding. Like I said, once you get it where you get confidence, you know what to look for, uh, you know, you know where to be at. I mean, it's something that I really enjoy because, you know, there's not as many people on the water that time of year. And um, you got a chance to always catch a good one, especially in late winter. That's some of the best time of the year to catch giant bass. For sure. Cool. Let's get some questions. Uh, Arthur asked Randy about the Lamar City Lake. We went over there, uh, your little home lake. He asked if you'd fish there in the winter and how you caught them there in the past, if you've caught them there. No, I've, I've never fished over there in the wintertime. The water's pretty dirty at Lamar Lake. You, you don't have a lot of good water visibility, but um, I hear stories about guys catching them over there in the wintertime. I've just, I've just never been over there before. I would say go fish down the, the dam where the rock is and just throw a square bill or throw a flat side crankbait down that dam back and forth all day long. That's where I would be. I know there's a bunch of fish there. I caught them there in our one video there. So uh, 
I know that they're there. That's what I'd be doing. Um, uh, Joe asks, it seems like you're catching bass still in the deepest sections relative to the closest spawning pockets in terms of like where we're catching them in the winter. I would agree with that. You do want to have some deep water access on any of these wintertime areas. So if we pull back up Navionics here, any spot that I'm looking at on Navionics for like a good creek, you want to have some deep water access. You want to have some water that runs in. Now, one thing that's crazy is like, I know Jason Christie, he caught some really good fish in the Bassmaster Classic one year in this pocket right here. It looks like nothing, but there's actually just like a little ditch that runs in there and there's 15 foot of water here and it runs in this little tiny pocket and he caught some really good fish there. So you don't have to necessarily be, you know, even near like 20, 30 feet of water. As long as you're near some depth of water, 15 feet ish of water, there are going to be fish a lot of times that will relate there. But yeah, definitely having a little bit of deeper water close to those set shallow flat points is always helpful. Um, kind of basically deep water out in front of spawning pockets. That's where a lot of good shallow water winter bass are. Any any other thoughts there, Andy? Yeah, deep water is relative. It's just like that secondary point I was showing you guys in the back of Duck Creek. Um, water The water depth out off that point was 15, 18 feet deep, um, which was plenty deep enough. I mean, with 15 or 20 foot of water is deep water, so... You know, don't let that scare you off. It's not like you've got to have 40 or 50 foot of water right next to your areas to form to be good. You, sure. get, you just don't want an area that has a long area of just flat water with no breaks on it. You need you need to have some type of a gradual slope, uh, whether it be point in, sides, whatever, that gradually slope down or drop off quickly close by. Sure. Not that it has to be that deep, but it just has to be relative to that to the cover you're fishing. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Perfect. Um, question from Mike. He asks, do you like to fish uphill in the winter or downhill? What he means by uphill or downhill, guys, is if you're fishing uphill, it means that you are putting your boat in shallow water, casting in the deeper water, and then reeling your bait from deep water up to the shallower water, or then casting downhill is where you put your boat in the channel, the deepest water, cast up into shallower water, and then reel your bait down. In the winter, I find that I always catch more and bigger fish when I put my boat up in shallow water, cast out in the deeper water, and drag my bait from deep into shallow. I just I learned that from guys on uh, when I used to fish a bunch of, of um, local tournaments, the Mister Bass of Arkansas. A couple guys showed me that some of the the old guys who would just Carolina rig points and they just throw Carolina rig. They put their boat on the bank, cast out into the middle of nowhere, drag their bait uphill, and they would catch giants. And so I've kind of got that stuck in my head. I don't know if it makes that big of a difference, but I find that it's unique and different. And if you are fishing in a tournament, it can help put a few extra fish in the boat because those fishes aren't used to seeing it. But if you're fishing down the bank, Randy, do you ever do that? Do you ever like put your boat on the bank and then cast out? I, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in angles and, you know, when you're, let's just say points, for example, like that. I mean, most people cast deep into shallow on points. That's the, that's what the bass see all the time. If you're fishing a bottom bouncing lure, like, you know, a football head jig, shaky head, whatever. Um, I think it can be effective casting deep to shallow or like a swim bait, something you can count down, but for something like a jerk bait, I've never done that good casting deep to shallow because, the, the bait, by the time it gets to its maximum strike zone, you're not really in the best depth zone. So I think a lot of it depends on the bait you're throwing. But for a like football head jig, swim bait, I think it's definitely an effective technique. Cool, good stuff. Uh, Robert asked, you said, Randy, you watched a vlog today um, where the statement was made that Table Rock needs a good shad kill to improve the fishing. Your thoughts on that? Well, I've always found that shad kills make fishing really tough. And, you know, if I see a shad kill on any of the lakes that I'm fishing at that are obvious, I try to get away from them. Because um, they, when you have a shad kill, you've got such an easy food source for bass that um, it can be very difficult to catch them. So um, I, I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, I, I the, the, for the most part, I mean... If you've got a lake that like they've got an unhealthy population of skinny bass possibility, but um, for all the lakes that I fish around this part of the country, I've run the other way if I see a big shad shad kill. That's interesting because I always found that it was at least in like the Arkansas River. If I saw a shad kill going on, that's when I picked up a jerk bait and started throwing it, and I catch a lot of good fish on a jerk bait around the shad kill. 
Um, maybe not like right where most of the shad are, but like on the boundaries of where the shad are starting to die. I find that yeah. I catch him doing that. That's interesting that you do that. I always yeah. think I should go run towards it. So maybe I've been doing it wrong this whole time, guys. <laughs> I, you know, a lot of it could be the type of lake you're fishing or the species in it. I mean, or the water depth, water clarity. There could be a, and I'm talking specifically around the Ozark lakes because that's where I fish at in the wintertime. But I know, for example, at Table Rock Lake, um, I just can't catch him very good around a big shad kill. I've got to, like, get away from that. So That's interesting. So, I've caught him on the... Yeah, it's relative to the the degree, the degree of the shad kill too, because you know, if you see an occasional dead shad flicker and it's not that big of a deal, but if you start seeing them all over the place, that's when I usually go the other direction. Yeah, I would agree with that. A lot of times, there's a difference between a shad kill and a shad stun. I found like on Lake Dardanelle, a lot of times you'll find that the shad will get stunned. You might have one or two shad floating up every minute around your boat, but they're not dead. They're just kind of like stunned. That's when it's really good, I find, for that jerkbait bite. But when there's yeah. like a million dead shad on the surface, yeah, that's not as good because those bass can just eat. So I think there's a difference, too, between the shad stun and the shad kill, which is a subtle difference, but I think that that is definitely a difference. Yeah. Awesome. Um, let's see here. Everyone's saying there's going to be 25 boats on the area. You should have recaught that 10-pounder. So um, maybe we shouldn't go fishing there this week. <laughs> uh, let's see here trying to get uh how would you attack a smaller shallow lake average of six to eight feet with cypress trees and stumps in the winter time i would find the clearest water i could and i would either try to find any short shallow grass or rock if you can't find clear water you can't find grass just find any rock there's usually some sort of causeway or dam or something just go throw a crankbait on rock any rock you can find and you're going to catch them in the winter that's the best way i found in those situations would you agree there andy yeah, also, I'd look for ditches running through some of the cypress tree areas. And if you can get some ditches that are close to those cypress, the fish will, will be on those cypress above anything else. Yeah, let me show you an example of that, guys, actually, since we're over at Millwood, what Randy means there. Um, so here's an example of Millwood with these are, I think these are cypress. I don't know for a fact. Yeah, these are definitely cypress. So if we look at the lake here, this is the lake at full pool. I don't know how I know. All. I, I, I have no too many areas for examples of stuff. I look for stuff all the time, Randy. I kind of surprise myself knowing be able to pull up random spots mm -hmm. on cue. But here is the area I'm talking about. Um, let me find the lake is down. Here you go. This is what Randy's talking about with the ditch. I know you can't see my screen, Randy, but um, this is like a ditch, basically, or you have this uh, deeper water. You can see there's actual water here, and there's cypress trees through this. But if we take the lake back up to full pool boom, you can see that normally this area is full of, there's some vegetation there, but there's it's full of um, water. So all of these trees over here and on the edge of this ditch are in, let's say, two to three feet of water. The center of the ditch is in eight or nine feet of water. And this is the type of area in the winter you can catch them in. If you can find these ditches, this deeper water that runs through and fishing these trees on the edge when the lake is at full pool. That is what kind of Randy was talking about. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, Doug asks, how would, you, how would speed of retrieve for largemouth in Michigan Lake after ice out? Water's probably in the upper 30s. I used to actually fish on ice out up in Wisconsin a lot. I find that those fish are super aggressive after the ice out. And actually, there's a great video if you want, uh, Doug. Go watch Mark Zona snapping a tube for pre-spawn bass it's just on mark zona's youtube channel is mark zona snapping tube he's fishing on the ice out for largemouth in michigan and he's catching them throwing a tube with a half ounce weight getting it caught in grass and ripping it like setting the hook on it and pulling that bait 10 15 feet and then stopping it and then getting it caught in the grass and ripping it free you watch the video he explains it really well and he's hammering them in 39 to 40 degree water fishing like i mean he's fishing fast and I think those fishing was like Michigan, Wisconsin, places like that, the cold temperatures just do not bother them. Like as soon as that ice is gone, they know that that the water's gonna be warming up and it's time to start spawning. So they just start feeding immediately. And you can fish pretty quick and still catch them. Do you have any experience with that, Randy? Nope, I don't have any experience other than having uh, ice out of the back of some coves here in the Ozarks. But uh, <laughs> normally, like I said, I just go to a jerk bait once that. Uh, ice starts to thaw out a little bit, but here again, that's uh, not a predominant smallmouth fishery. Yeah, that's 
it's kind of a niche little deal. It's kind of weird that I grew up in Wisconsin and then moved down to Arkansas. It's kind of a unique set of experiences where I kind of got both yeah. a little bit. Um, question from Living Missouri Outdoors. Um, he's asking if uh, those fish on Lake Dardanelle that I was showing were released fish. Yes, those were 100% released fish on that, that dam there on the boat ramp. Um, release fish are really big in the winter too because a lot of tournaments go out in the winter and they release all that big fish. And you can catch a lot of good release fish in the winter more than other seasons even because they'll stay right by the rock and the stuff that they're on the boat ramps. Um, question from JJ. He's asking, are you going to post any of the old seminars for purchase? We're not um, just because um, – we are trying trying to like you know change up the seminars and improve them over time. We want to be able to redo the seminars and continue to improve them. So uh, we're not going to be reposting them, but we do have a lot of seminars available, guys. If you are interested, and what JJ is talking about is the Fish the Moment um, seminars, just head over to fishthemoment.com. And if you head to our website, fishmoment.com, you can check out the virtual seminars page. And if you guys want to know about winter fishing, I highly recommend signing up for the jerkbait seminar we have coming up. We send a recording of the seminar to everyone who signs up. So even if you can't attend on Thursday, January 7th at 6 9 p.m., we'll send you a recording of it and you can watch it back anytime, as many times as you want. So sign up for the seminar and... Randy is going to talk everything jerkbaits. He knows more about jerkbaits, especially for wintertime bass, probably than pretty much anyone else in the country. And so he knows what he's talking about. We're talking about areas, retrieves, weather conditions, as well as bait modifications, everything you need to know. And we do have my electronic seminar coming up too, where I'm going to be talking about everything you know in terms of how to dial in your graphs to determine what size bass are, whether they're active or not, whether you should even fish the fish once you see them on your electronics. I'll be going over like 200 different images from both side imaging, down imaging, and 2D sonar. You guys are going to be dialed in for the season on electronics. So definitely sign up for the seminar if you want to get your electronics game back up, uh, ready for the tournament season. So um, yeah, I just want to talk about that real quick. And also remember guys, check out these learning plans. Um, that I put together. I'm very, very uh, happy about this, just putting this together. These are all my best offshore fishing videos. So if you have liked some of my videos in the past, definitely check these out. These are all my best ones. And sometimes it's hard to find the best ones on YouTube, but these are the ones that I put the most time into. All of these were 20 to 40 hours I spent editing and producing these videos. So definitely check that out in the fishmoment.com under the learning plans. So... Awesome. Well, we got a few more questions here, and then we're going to call the night. Um, let's see here. Oh my gosh, there's so many questions. I guess over Christmas break, everyone was uh, excited about uh, talking to Fish the Moment. We haven't done a seminar in a while. Um, let's see here. Um, sorry, guys, just trying to find another question. Okay, maybe it's just people talking to each other. Okay, here we go, David. Uh, what is the best way to measure water clarity? The way I do it is I just put like a bright colored crankbait, whether it's like a sartreuse or a white crankbait. I reel it all the way up to the rod tip. I stick the rod tip into the water, and then I wait till I see the bait disappear. I pull my rod out, and I just kind of pinch the rod, and that tells me water clarity. But honestly, as much as Randy and I fish, we pretty much can just tell you the water clarity just pulling into a pocket. Would you agree with that, Randy? <laughs> Yeah, you can look at the you know, baits in the water too, but one of the things that I like to do is I like to take a look at the water clarity like when I launch the boat in the morning at the boat ramp because that, that gives you a good indication of how far you can see down on the bottom. So I look at the bottom of the ramp and I run baits through the water too. Yep. And then uh, uh, Siren is asking, are there any more on the water classes? Yes, we do have on the water lessons with Randy. So you can head over to fishmoment.com, sign up for an on the water lesson with Randy and uh, he can help you out, and you can go to all different lakes here in the Ozark region, and the lakes are listed there. Um, do winter spots hold up better, or do they shut off faster? As uh, J Mavs, winter spots are always more consistent. You just are, if you're fishing in a tournament, you're never going to win off winter spots unless you're on Lanier or like that kind of area. Maybe like a Hartwell, if because that you could win off spots because a lot of three and four pound spotted bass. But unless your lake consistently produces three and four pound spotted bass regularly, most of the time, yeah, spotted bass are way more consistent, but it's hard to win any tournaments or do well in any tournaments on spotted bass. Um, but usually you can find them schooled up a little bit easier, catch them offshore with your electronics. If you're good with your electronics, they're pretty easy to find and catch. They're just 
not usually big enough to make an impact. Would you agree there, Randy? Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, the winter patterns will hold up a lot longer. Like I said, if you're concentrating around any hard structure, you know, submerged timber, breaks, points, that type of stuff, ditches, uh, you know, that makes them last a lot longer if you can find them on that. Yep. Um, question from uh, McKean, why does clear water impact winter fishing? I think it's just the fact that the clear water, those fish can see a bait from further away. And so when you're working fast, they just, that instinct to kind of chase a bait and eat it is is stronger. And it's actually crazy, Randy, because when you see this like super cold water, you would think these fish are super lethargic. I found like I can throw a jerk bait. I was using my live scope and I was throwing a jerk bait over the top of brush piles on that same day I was catching them on the jig. And I would see like three and four pound bass. I guarantee you they're three and four pounders following my jerk bait out of a brush pile like 30, 40 feet, following it and nosing up on it and just not eating it. But they were following it all around. And this was 43 degree water temperature with maybe three foot of visibility. So they were tracking that thing forever. And I just think that the fish are not really that lethargic in, unless the water temperature is like sub 40, they're not like super lethargic. Even when you have, you know, you know, super cold temperatures, it's just that water visibility, as long as it's clear, they can see that bait and they're just that instinct to go chase after food, regardless of how cold it is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome. Okay, so um, w one more question here. We'll take this from John. He asks, uh, can offshore structure 5 to 10 feet rock pile in the middle of a 30-foot lake hold winter bass, or is it bank fishing? Is bank fishing better? Definitely those offshore rock piles and stuff, John, are going to hold a lot of big fish at certain times. It just depends on if there's bait fish out there. There's a lot of factors. Um, I find that I catch a lot of big fish offshore in the winter, really good fish and quant like good qu quantities as well. But I would say that it's a lot harder to find winter bass offshore. Locating them is harder than it is in the summer. But when you find them, it's really good. But it's a lot easier to find shallow fish in the winter. But maybe the size isn't always as consistent. Would you agree there, Randy? Yeah, definitely so. And like I said, water clarity also has a big thing to do on that. If you can find those rocks in clean, clear water and deep water, I mean, those fish will live on them all winter long, especially if you get a big spotted bass population. Yeah, for sure. Um, two more questions here. Uh, Joe Sesson, John, is the advanced offshore electronics the same as the electronics class coming up? Yeah, the we're, we're changing up all the names, guys. It, Joe, the seminar is very similar. I'm changing it up a little bit. Um, I'm going to standardize it going forward. We just started these seminars like the last couple of months. So I know the names and all the different things are kind of all over the place. Uh, the content is going to be different. I'm going to change up. I'm probably going to add a whole new hour section to it, but probably I would say 50% will be the same. 50% will be different. I'm just going to kind of restructure how the seminars are going um to make it make a little more sense so uh, bear with us while we kind of figure out how to make the seminars work that's also what we're not selling them for sale again because i'm trying to organize the content so that it makes the most sense going forward so we want if you attend multiple seminars to make sure there's not a bunch of overlap between all the seminars because that just defeats the purpose and if we sell the seminars it kind of just makes it really confusing so um in 2021, we're going to get all that squared away. There's a lot of stuff we're getting squared away. So i um, really excited about that. We're going to be doing those tournaments, Randy and I, those team tournaments. So I'm excited about that. And let us know, guys, in the comments down below what type of other video content you would enjoy for 2021. We're going to be doing a lot of you know on-the-water stuff, electronic stuff. Randy's going to be on the water with me. Um, we're going to be doing tournament videos. So we're going to try to mix it up. We're also going to try to put a higher emphasis on quality content. So we may be putting out fewer videos, maybe you know one a week, but we're going to be going for super high production quality. That's kind of our goal. And so hopefully you guys are going to be enjoying that. And oh, Randy, how did you like that uh, that video I made about the analytics? I made that one with the Big Bass Index, and I know a lot of guys like that. Uh, I, I was hoping I didn't lose too many people with that. That was like my data science background, like kicking in. I was an economics major and did data analytics for a job for corporate for a while. But uh, what did you think about that video? That, that was so interesting because that goes to show you, you know, if you're wanting to win tournaments and catch bass, it sort of shows you how you can systematically narrow down, you know, your options there. And, you know, when you broke that down and showed about how many big bass, you know, the, 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 the amount of big bass for the time you threw the football head jig, that was unbelievable. 
I mean, that, I can just see why you never want to put that thing down when we go fishing. It's I, producing so many four pound bass. It's crazy. Like in the fall and the winter, I might as well just throw a football jig all day long. Yeah. Like I'm literally not going to catch any more big fish than if I just keep it in my hand. It was so funny because after that video, I posted that video the day after I went out to the lake and I told you about this. I went out and I was like, man, I need to throw a football jig more. I throw a football jig. I catch 24 pounds from my best five fish. The next day I go out and I say, I'm just going to throw a football jig all day. I catch a seven, a six, a five, and a four all on that football jig right after I posted that video. And so I'm going to stick with that, those baits for most of the videos going forward, kind of using that as my guidepost for 2021. And maybe we need to be sticking to that too. I want to do that maybe for you too, Randy, uh, your your baits, and we can try to get that data together for you the best we can. Yeah, that'd be interesting for sure. Because yeah. I think that'd be good for our tournaments to kind of know what your strengths are, and we can kind of redo the analysis for you. I think that'd be fun. There you go. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, well, let's... Uh, yeah, let's close up for the night. But guys, if you enjoyed this stream, again, we do have the full recording available on YouTube after the live stream is finished. And we post every single live stream on the Fish Moment podcast on Apple and Spotify. So if you guys do want to listen to us talk about fishing while you're on the way to the lake or at work, we also post our YouTube videos on there as well. So you can just listen to the content and then you can also watch it back on YouTube. You get all the graphics and all the stuff like that. And also, if you're still here, there's 306 of you guys. And if you're still here watching, I would highly uh, or I really appreciate if you went down below and left a comment and also left a thumbs up on this video. It helps the YouTube algorithm a ton if you guys leave comments and if you leave thumbs up. Thumbs up are the most important. So just go leave a like on the video. It helps us out a ton and helps get this video out to more people. And we just appreciate everyone spending a Tuesday afternoon with us, 350 people, uh, about 4,000 overall. It's pretty good stuff, Randy. So excited that uh, everyone is enjoying the stream and hope you guys have a great new year. Randy, you as well, and excited to get fishing with you this year. Yeah, no doubt, man. I can't, I can't wait, wait till the season gets here. here. Like I said, we got a lot coming up this year. In addition to the fishing tournaments, I mean, we just we got a lot on the plate, and uh, it's just it's really satisfying to Johnny and myself both to be able to, to to be able to have such a passionate audience to present this information to because that to me that's one of the most satisfying things about fishing is like when you can share information with people that are sincerely wanting that information. Um, back in the day, we used to do fishing seminars. It would have like 100 people in the seminars, and you see half of them falling asleep in the audience. But you guys are passionate, you're driven, you're focused, you want to become better anglers, and that really uh, encourages us to want to put that content out there. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks again for all the support. We really appreciate it, and we're excited for 2021, hopefully putting on a ton of great content, helping you guys become better fishermen. So have a great new year, and we'll see you guys soon.